Hello and welcome to episode 40 of Webflow, the podcast dedicated to uncovering the greatest failures behind the greatest web flowers, because success often comes after learning from many failures. I'm your host, Jack, and today my guest is Lizzie Curtis. Lizzie is the head of design and development at Side Labs, a social impact agency that uses the power of no code to make the world a better place. Lizzie started off as a graphic designer and illustrator, and then taught for Shillington as a graphic design teacher. She then freelanced before harnessing the power of no-code tools to advance civilization forward. Some fun facts about Lizzie. She uh, sings in a community choir. She runs a detective agency. And she rides a yellow bicycle. Lizzie, welcome to the Webflow podcast. Thanks, Jack. What a pleasure to be here. It is so fun having you on. I haven't seen you since your amazing talk at the Webflow London meetup. That was so fun. I really enjoyed that. You smashed that, by the way. Can I, I haven't you. actually, I, I can't believe I haven't spoken to you properly after that. Yeah. You you were a comedian. And I think everyone was like, whoa, since when did all the people that do Webflow was so funny? It was great. <laughs> it was such a, I mean, it was just such a wholesome evening. It's like, yeah. what can you not enjoy about that little combination of people and thoughts and lives all converging it was beautiful yeah it was really fun and I think um but everyone got quite a lot out of the different talks and I think your talk in comparison to Joe's and Will's was like a good mix of topics yeah and... really nice spread of different subjects and expertise and you kind of bounced off each other as well it was it was good it was yeah anyway that was great so for anyone that didn't come to the webflow london meetup shame on you you missed out no you've got to come to the next one and the next one will be announced soon exciting times ahead um so i want to just dig into your past a little bit for anyone that doesn't know you i've just said you were an illustrator designer and then you came across the power of no code tools tell me about that change yeah, so I started off, I did a degree in illustration and I started off my career as a freelance illustrator, which very uh, slowly and, um, what's the word, Un unofficially um, moved into graphic design. Um, I was actually working in a cafe, community cafe. I've got a real soft spot for community cafes. If I walk past one, I'm like, oh, I've got to go make a coffee. I've got to go <laughs> chat with some customers. I just love it. I love it so much. I think in an alternate life, I would be just running a cafe somewhere. But I definitely imagine that, actually. Yeah, I mean, just, yeah. There are lots of things that I actually couldn't do with it, which is probably why I still don't work in a cafe. But anyway, um, I did things like um, did the menu in the cafe and then regular customers would come in and say oh I like the design of the menu can you design me a business card and that was basically how my graphic design career started was making things for regular customers and then it was at one of those cafes that I found Webflow and I built the website for the cafe in Webflow and that was like possibly one of my first Webflow things and that was before Webflow had a CMS so I was literally right at the start just in, putting think, in all the different menu items manually just, oh yeah yeah well it's just me managing it so I didn't need to hand it over to anyone so it was all good yeah okay. and then yeah sorry I was just, I cut you off when you were no, it's in, all good. in your flow it's so all good. that happened then you carried on with Webflow I imagine yes I built websites for customers who came into the cafe that is the um, randomest way of getting clients I've ever heard. Amazing. You were just you serving them beans on toast and then they were like, who did this menu? It's beautiful. And you were Literally. like, crazy. Well, was me. <laughs> yeah. I had some of the best clients as well. I'm not even joking. So there was, so the, the cafe is in Limehouse and there's a, there's actually like a, a, a convent in Limehouse of an actual community of nuns. And because the cafe was so close, the nuns would sometimes come in for a coffee. You know, everyone's got to have coffee, haven't they? And uh, no. one of them came in and was like, we've heard that there's a designer here and we've unearthed a memoir of um, a nun from in France who was like writing their memoir in like a really 
important time in history and it's all written in French. I've translated it and we want it published as a little book. Can you design the book? So I literally did like this little typesetting job of a job of, of this book. And that was the, one of my best clients yet. <laughs> God, that is the craziest client. Like, wow. Just imagine that you live near a convent, you're serving coffees to nuns and then a job. A job comes, comes, it, yeah. comes from the higher power. You don't necessarily see that on those like ways to grow your webflow agency. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Ten all, ways to grow your agency. Work in a community cafe. <laughs> Perfect the flat white <laughs> to build a trust with your customer. <laughs> Make coffee so good that Jesus would drink it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's crazy. A good strap line. <laughs> and then was this kind of where the the detective agency came in as well because you obviously kind of were involved with clients yeah. that were doing their own detective work is that kind of where you were just like oh this is actually kind of fascinating it, you know tell, tell us about how yeah. that came in as well there were a lot of connections with this sort of meeting lots of random people and the start of the tech detective agency I think it was actually anecdotally sitting around a table with a bunch of friends and one person said oh I saw a UFO once and it's never been explained and then a friend who I was with was like ah was it this and had like google search you know had the picture and she was like yes it was that and then it was kind of like a case solved anecdotally over the table and then we were just like do you know what I think we could really make this a thing because like everyone's got an anecdotal mystery at some point like if you're at the pub at some point and say you run a detective agency, someone from the group of people that you're with is going to say, yes, something mysterious has happened. And it's as easy as that to get clients. Genius. And just so we're clear, I mean, it's you're not actively trying to get clients for the detective agency, are you? Or, or are you? <laughs> clients come to us. The right people come to us. Are you serious? Yeah. I didn't realise it was like an actual... Yeah. Okay. It's an actual I've... detective agency. Yeah. I, I mean, I thought it was kind of like an actual, act, an actual detect. That's really hard to say. An actual detective agency in the sense that you know you and your friends met up to solve mysteries, but I didn't realize that like you had clients, clients. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, the first mystery is usually like how people find the agency, because SEO is actually terrible on the site. Um, so that's like one hurdle they have to cross. And then we'll get a little message on the form, little little notification. You've got a new Webflow form submission on your site. <laughs> and then someone says, I've got a mystery for you. <laughs> i got a mystery for you. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. So if anyone is interested in checking out um, Lizzie's agency, sorry, Lizzie's detective agency marmont road is the name and do you um, want to explain hyphen marmont hyphen road um it's the road that we used to live on it's really uh not very original we thought you know i kind of like it though because it's got a bit of a sherlock holmesy vibe to it and it's mm -hmm. also you know it's one of those that you look at it and you know unless you're a londoner londoner I guess you wouldn't know that road necessarily. You wouldn't, no. You'd so then to, it's you'd like... you have to really know your geography of London. <laughs> yeah, but then you've got to look it up. You know, maybe there's some kind of, uh, you know, double entendre with it, or maybe there's some kind of hidden meaning, and instantly you're in kind of detective mode as mm -hmm. someone that, you know, you're like, Marmont Road. And then the URL is Marmont hyphen road as well. So, you know, that's going to kick some people. They're not going to know that. They're not going to know about the hyphen. They're not going to know about the hyphen. So there's like a lot of, you know, you're kind of, testing, lot of <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're testing your clients here to, to <laughs> find you. It is probably worth mentioning that we don't do crimes. Like we don't investigate crimes just no. to make sure that that's clear. Yeah. The, yeah. the missing ham, the childish voice, the kids in the window. These are some of the, uh, the featured cases that are on the website. If anyone's keen to check it out, mm -hmm. you're the first detective I've had on the podcast so oh, really? what congratulations. an honor thank you yeah <laughs> yeah um but so you're doing detective work and then you're 
obviously extremely busy with client work. Mm -hmm. How on earth do you do you juggle your time? Is it detective work by night? I imagine it is. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. In between things. Um, to be honest, the detective work takes up less time than you might imagine. <laughs> Are you just going on Google? Just a quick, quick Google search. <laughs> well, we tend to try and refuse like uh, briefs, uh, detective briefs that can be Googled because then you're like, oh, that's not a mystery then, is it? <laughs> too, too easy, mate. Too easy. <laughs> <laughs> but it usually takes just like a bit of, you know, it's like a, a, a little, a wee dram of whiskey and then a, you turn the lights down low in the evening and then you have a little think about it and then put out ideas, you know. And so you've got it's your not, pipe. It, you've got your pipe, you've got your hat on and everything. Yeah, so it's less intense, it has to be said. Um, <sighs> it's probably actually more like the day job and plus also I set up my own little business that has, I've got a few clients for that as well. So that's probably the thing that takes up actual free time wow okay and when you say a little business are you talking about jammer buck studio mm, yeah 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 okay so just to be clear then because I, I don't think i've explained this very well in the intro so you're doing side labs you're mm -hmm. working for that agency for your like working time nine to five type yeah. thing and then you're also doing mom and road and your own freelance clients with your own studio, Jammerbuck Studio. Is yeah, that right? That's right, yeah. Wow. Okay. You're a busy, busy lady fighting busy, crime. Busy we're Lizzie. Not, we're not crime. Oh, yeah, busy Lizzie. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily fighting crime, M finding missing hams mm -hmm. and no code powering. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible scenes. I think you're one of the most interesting guests I've had on. Let's just rewind for anyone that's listening and is like, how the hell do I manage my time with multiple different clients and life? You seem to be doing that quite well. How would you advise someone to think about a block of time and the tasks that they need to do? Hmm. Um, prioritization. Mm -hmm. um, um, I tend to break down the things I need to do and give give myself a little estimate of how long I think things are going to take from the outset, but also how what what type of activity it is. So some stuff like detective stuff is all just thinking, and you tend to need to have longer than half an hour to do that kind of work but then there's work that's like more more manual I feel like like designing especially if it's like implementing a design across multiple pages something like that um I feel like that's less thinking more doing mm. um, and it's then easier to um what's the word like be efficient on things and speed yeah. up efficiency on those kinds of tasks if you're trying to like yeah. make more time in the day that makes sense so what you're saying is that you can do the things that you need to get done um like that are visual that you don't really need to think about and that what you can do is just do those kind of manual tasks and also have space to think about detective work while you're just doing the manual <laughs> yeah genius so if anyone runs a detective agency and a studio that's your advice guys just <laughs> do the detective work while you're doing the manual tasks of client work but i also think you must be very good at time blocking you know thinking okay i've got to get this done and you just you have to get it done because i often think sometimes the problem comes when you've got too much time to do something and then yeah. that task expands to fill that time Whereas That's if you've got point. an hour, you've, you've got, got an hour. Like you have to get that thing out the door to, you know, to a client or, um, yeah. you know, you've got a meeting that's coming up in an hour. You've got to show client work. It's like, okay, I need to get this done yeah. now. Um, so I think <laughs> maybe it was uh, also having a kid that was then really like makes that 
more important and maybe that was good training as well because then yeah it's like okay time is different time is very different let's yeah uh, see i've what heard we can matt do here. evans matt evans said this as well he said that the biggest life hack um he's ever had to be more efficient at doing stuff is is having a kid um <laughs> so it's like quite an expensive option but it's uh like a very strange productivity tool <laughs> yeah i mean you look at a kid and you think oh they're not that going to be that productive but but he i mean he smashes stuff out so um i i really do believe it is and so just to be clear then you went from a designer and illustrator to a no coder. And I think a lot of people have this kind of a path in the Webflow space. It's quite interesting when, um, you know, people say I'm a Webflower and it's kind of like, I'm a person as well. You know, ha like what does that kind of um, mean to, to differentiate you? Obviously you use the tool Webflow, but you've got, you know, um, you might be coming at the tool from a completely different skill set to someone else. Um, but, you've obviously got a really keen eye for design and then you've harnessed um, the power of Webflow. But why did you choose Webflow out of, you know, all these different tools? Because obviously there's um, plenty of different no-code tools that are easier to use. Hmm. Why Webflow? When I, so when I um, found Webflow, I'd already been um, doing some bit of coding. So um, HTML and CSS sites like my, my own site, I think the previous cafe site, and also the uh, comedy group that I used to be part of did all of that site. Um, and it got to the point when um, um, sites were needing to be responsive. So it's kind of like dates of the point I found Webflow. And the fact that it used all of the principles that I was already familiar with, and uh, the code was coming out super clean, and it released me to not have to learn how to make something responsive by coding it. That was that was why. And actually, I just fell in love with Webflow straight away. There wasn't even any other tool. I was like, oh, maybe I should use this one. I was just literally like, oh my gosh, Webflow. And I even got an email that I sent to web to the Webflow team. It was in like something ridiculous, like 2015. I was like, hi, Webflow. Um, I've been using Webflow for a couple of months now, and I just wanted to say I really like it. Um, thanks, Lizzie. <laughs> that was my email. And they got back and they said, oh, good. <laughs> well done. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. Well, have a good life. <laughs> nice. Thank from you. Yeah, all right. <laughs> and I feel like I've also, uh, yeah, I think it just continued in that way. I just didn't, it was my first love, you know, and I haven't, I haven't, been tempted never, to never look back no. <laughs> <laughs> haven't got eyes for anyone else <laughs> exactly it okay. sounds, sounds a bit silly but it's just what happened <laughs> no that's great and so i mean in in the time in terms of the the no code space i mean it's interesting that um side labs is like we are a no code agency mm. because i feel like a lot of agencies might actually use quite a lot of no code tools to actually build stuff um but they won't publicly advertise that it's a no code tool in the same way that it seems to be your kind of value proposition mm. um is that just because you want clients to know that look once we've built this for you you can use it moving forward is is that kind of part of the idea or you know what why do you, why is that such a highlight for side labs yeah i think i think what it's it's about not necessarily just about the tools but about the mindset of no code it being about democratizing about being putting these really powerful tools into the hands of people who who may be non-technical but have ideas or have ways of thinking that can improve the world and so i think it's not necessarily like come to us and we will use no code it's kind of like, come to us and we will problem solve in a way that it harnesses all the principles of what no code is about. Mm. And in some ways, maybe there's a better way of communicating that because no code is a jargon thing. They're like, when I rock up to my community choir and they say, so what do you do? And I'm like, well, no code. Then they're like, okay, 
go away. <laughs> I don't know who you are, what you do. So, <laughs> so there, there, there is kind of maybe a blocker of jargon by leading with that, but also maybe, yeah, maybe there's just a bit of thinking to do around like, how do you express that mindset of what no code is about? Yeah, I mean, I think this idea of looking for solutions across, you know, all the different tools that are out there to find something that not only is quicker, easier to prototype and and to change things quickly if you need to, but also for your client to then use moving forward, I think is quite a big selling point. Um, a lot of clients seem to approach you know, Webflow is saying, I've got this WordPress website and I don't know how to use it, or I've got, you know, a custom coded website and it costs me a hundred pounds an hour to go to the developer to change, you know, a picture and whatever, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, but it's interesting that you say that actually it's less about that. It's more like we are going to be harnessing the power of all these different tools to ensure that we have a solution that's you know, fits um, the client needs as best as possible. Um, but I just think it's interesting that, you know, it, on the homepage above the fold, it's like no code. Like it's yeah. very much, um, you know, that's kind of a, a big USP, but interesting. Mm -hmm. yes. So are you ready to talk about your failures then? Okay. Yeah, I'm ready. We've done the chit chat. Now we're getting into the meat, <laughs> the meat and potatoes. Um, so tell me about failure number one. Failing to communicate what's okay and what's not okay and setting boundaries. Mm, yeah. I kind of feel like boundaries is kind of one of the key things I've needed to learn. And I'm still learning. And it feels like there's plenty more to learn. So that, um, that uh, what's okay and what's not okay is the definition of boundaries from Brené Brown. So I don't know if you've heard any of her stuff. But yeah, yeah. She's amazing. I, yeah, she's amazing on podcasts if anyone's uh, intrigued to listen to her. Yeah, and I just absolutely love that definition because I've always heard of the word boundaries. Oh, you've got to have really good boundaries. And I'm like, like oh, how do you – what? what is that? <laughs> but just defining it as like what's okay and what's not okay has just been incredibly helpful. And I guess that's in client work, in – design work in like work life balance it kind of can apply to so many different things um and it's something that i have failed to do and it has bitten me on the bum for not having done it but i mean i i always think it's interesting when people say oh you need you need to set strong boundaries because it's hard to know what even is the field where you're meant to put your boundaries if you yeah. haven't got kind of some life experience and a, and a sense of what's uh, what's right and wrong for you in the context of client work, I think. You know, sometimes I was talking to um, Elsa Amri on a podcast episode the other day, and she was saying that, um, you know, this, this client basically said, how much is it? Uh, you know, for this job. And she completely undersold herself and she charged very little. And they were like, yeah, great. When can we start? Perfect. And and this job carried on and she kind of got resentful every time they they paid her part of that, um, you know, retainer. And and I think that's a really good measure to know where your boundaries lie. Like if, mm. you, if you're kind of resentful when you get given what you've asked for from life, then maybe you need to reevaluate you know what why that is and 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 kind of and work through that and then and that might lead you to to know where your boundaries lie does that make sense that is exactly it it's kind of like you have to go through it to find out okay yep that was not okay <laughs> yeah exactly but then you're kind of like oh why did i why do we have to learn things like that why can't mm. we learn it just by reading about it yeah. Why do we have to actually go through the feeling of resentment, pain, terror, all kinds of things just to learn that that's not okay and how to then mitigate against that in the future? But I guess, you mm. know, that's how you that's how you do it, isn't it? That's how you learn. Yeah. I mean, I kind of think that if you're not, um, if you're just cruising along and nothing's really going wrong, then... I, I 
I can't help feeling that, you know, that's not entirely healthy either, though. I mean, I think it's good to, you know, have um, have your assumptions and beliefs challenged a bit, you know, and mm -hmm. and make mistakes as you go along with client work. You know, for example, if you feel kind of resentful because you've done tons and tons of work for a project that you don't feel like you've charged enough, well, mm -hmm. good. That's going to lead you in the right. That's going to get you closer to, um, you know, whatever you are going to be happy to get paid with once you, um, you know, know what that figure is or, or, you know, know how much effort correlates to what amount of, um, you know, financial exchange of, of energy, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I kind of think it's as much as you're like, oh, this is a bit of a failure. I kind of think that's a healthy one in the context of freelancing. I think you should maybe always be, be kind of figuring out what your boundaries are depending on, on where you are with your career and, and what your experiences are with clients. Mm, I love that. That is really important, isn't it? Because it's like, you could definitely view it as being like, I did not set the right boundary, or I have failed. Or you could view it being like, I have just discovered where a boundary should go. And this is great, because this will help me going forward. Which it's is a, a data really, point. It's really nice, because it's such a different mindset. Yeah, it, it's, it it's a data point. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And I think, I mean, just to kind of share what my experience is of this, I'm talking about this um, kind of quite passionately, just because very recently, um, I've had a very difficult client project where, you know, the scope's changed and there's a potential retainer in the mix. So I'm kind of like, ooh, do I want to push back at this stage and say, look, this is out of scope? Or do I want to say, okay, I'm going to do this, but just so that you know, moving forward, you know, that's out of line. And, I, and I've and i been trying to work out, you know, I think a lot of the time it's very easy to blame the client and say, mm -hmm. oh, this client's terrible, man, or whatever. And actually, I think often clients are bad because you haven't set clear enough boundaries and that might not even be your fault because you don't even know where the boundaries lie but then the, you then need to realize that and then kind of set expectations moving forward from yeah. from where that line has been crossed and like I just said I mean you can either say this is all your fault I'm never working with you again I'm getting out of this situation or you can just take a breath like reflect and just be like, okay, here's how I'm going to take charge of this situation, and um, and yeah, learn learn from that experience. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, that's definitely really important. And I think, like you were saying as well, like it's not necessary. Like you can want to blame it on the client, and I think there are genuinely difficult things to deal with 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 clients. Like there just always is going to be, just as there is with any relationship. There's always going to be humans. Like, they're so, so annoying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think you're totally right in that you can, it's still you how you manage them. But then it's learning to recognize what you need to pay attention to. So I think mm -hmm. in the past, I've definitely noticed like, oh, the, the client seems um, a little bit unsure on that. Oh, I'm sure they're, they're fine. And then at that moment, that was like, okay, no, that, they weren't fine. So that's like, but it's kind of like, remember, or not remember, like being aware and trusting your instinct and saying, actually, I need to like listen to that little instinct that says, I don't think they're quite understanding this or, and then over explaining because you, um, I read a really good James Clear quote, who's obviously my the easiest person to quote because he sends quotes in an email every week. It's fantastic. Um, about over-explaining and just how you've got nothing to lose by over-explaining because you just make sure that everyone's on the same page. And um, it's, yeah, responding to that little tiny voice in your head that says, I know, I'm not sure about this and, and learning how to listen to it. Yeah. Definitely. And actually coming off the back of that, um, Carlos Sepulveda, he talked about um, this in episode 37 of the podcast, where basically he'll write down what that 
client conversation has been, you know, what has been said during that client conversation and what the next steps are. So every time he has a client conversation, he'll be taking notes. You know, this, you have agreed to X, Y, Z. Here's what we talked about during this call. Here's what I'm going to be doing. Here's what you're going to get to me by next call, which will be on the, you know, 27th of April, whatever. And by making those notes, it might sound a bit like, oh, that's a massive effort after you've just had a client call. You've just talked about everything. Why would you need to write that down? But it's kind of just saying, look, it's almost just like a a, a kind of um, digital contract, as it were, that's mm. like, okay, this is what's been said. This is how we're moving forward. Just so that, you know, that's understood on both sides. Because I think a lot of the time, especially with visuals as well, you know, if you say to me, oh, I'd like a happy design. Okay. I mean, I might think yellows. I might think like round fonts. I might think animations. I'm, But your idea of happy might be something completely different visually. And I think that's, that's why, um, you know, these kind of never assuming, but always trying to, um, yeah, I guess bolster the idea that we want open communication that's very, very transparent. Um, mm -hmm. It's really key. Yeah, for sure. Um, by the way, I found this quote from Brené Brown as you were speaking, strong back, soft front, and wild, wild heart. heart. Yes, I love that. Yeah. It's so good. It's a there's great so quote. much to unpack from all of those things. Yeah. I feel like there's like a 40 minute podcast on just unpacking that quote. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's quite a nice idea to think about as a as a web flower. You know, you you're trying to be you know what your boundaries are. You know, you have a strong back after having had some client experiences that those boundaries might be, um, you know, more and more solidified for you, but you approach everyone with transparency and honesty with a soft front. And, um, you're not afraid to be wild, be wild, darling. Mm -hmm. I will never do that again. <laughs> Tell me about failure. Number two, working working my heart out on something I don't believe in. Mm. I don't even understand. I mean, I've got a sense of what that means, but t tell us what that means. Okay. Here we go. So I feel like where I'm at currently, I can, I can honestly say that with side labs, mm. I feel like I'm uniquely using my skills and experiences in a way that means that it's 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 me that I'm putting my myself into it I'm not doing something that I can I just can do I'm doing something that I'm uniquely positioned to do mm. but then also the output of the work that I'm producing is going towards something that I believe in in a bigger context mm. as in um, giving tools to nonprofits and charities so that their lives can be better mm. and therefore the end of service users' lives can be better. So I feel like I'm pouring a lot of energy into something that I feel is um, a, worthy, a worthy thing to be pouring my heart into. Um, however, in the past, I feel like I've been putting in similar amounts of effort and then seeing the end result going off into something, I'm like, oh they don't deserve that or what am I doing this for? Why am I putting all this effort in for that? Um, and then having a, like a fundamental mismatch and I, I, some personality types, you know, it's not an issue. Like if you're doing the thing that you love, it doesn't matter necessarily where it's going or who it's for. But I think for me, not recognizing that, um, that discomfort early enough potentially I almost wonder like maybe it's a boundary thing as well as in like do what is this okay or is this not okay and mm. I think I learned that it's not okay and actually to actually get the most out of work I need to be fully fully believing in what the outcome is and who it's for and what it's doing and why mm. that's an interesting <clears throat> idea that there needs to be like an alignment between your personal goals and then 
the business's goals that you're working for mm, yeah and that you're not just doing <clears throat> excuse me it's okay you gotta you gotta got cough sometimes frog, yeah you gotta fro- <laughs> frog it out do you want to just proper hawk it just like ugh, just get it out i think i think that's done it's like dislodged now yeah okay good well we just want to just want to double check that um <laughs> but yeah no it's important to have that that alignment for for some people and do you yeah. think where do you think that want for kind of i guess like personal value alignment and the businesses that you're working for values align what where do you think why do you think that's so important for you i think i've got a this intense desire to have a really cohesive output on all levels so i've got a really strong sense that i want to cultivate meaningful connections. I want Mm. to be proud of my processes and outputs, and I want to be making an impact for the positive. And everything that I do needs to be able to fit into those things. Otherwise I feel a fundamental mismatch and discomfort. And then a sense of resentment towards the things that I'm putting my energy into. Where that comes from, I'm not really sure really. I don't know is it like maybe it's purpose I think it's purpose I've got to feel like I, I want to have a purpose and I know what that is I know what I want to do it's just interesting to me because I'm not sure all of us can speak or I can't speak with the same clarity on how all the different pieces of life fit together as much as you so I'm just wondering mm-hmm. how that kind of came to be um the one thing that I absolutely love doing is taking myself off probably to like London South Bank Centre with my iPad, my notebook, a pint of beer on the waterside, and I just have a big old think about all of my activities, everything that I'm putting my heart into, and I have a big old think about my values. It's like one of my favorite things. If I could do it, I could probably do it about every six months, just to have a real like refresh. And it usually always comes back to the same thing. So I've got a bunch of questions I'm asking myself, like when are the times I'm feeling most proud? When are the times I'm feeling like I'm most engaged? When are the times I'm feeling um, or lots of like positive emotion or most energized? <clears throat> and then I'll note down all the things that then are, are doing that, are giving that, and then noticing trends within all of those. And that's how then I've identified like, okay, we really need to be in these areas in order to feel most aligned and therefore that that's what then gives me energy and I think maybe that's part of then why I've got so many things going on which maybe isn't always a good thing because sometimes there's just genuinely too much but um everything I want everything to give me energy and by assessing all of those things um it's really life-giving And I've definitely been in situations where I felt physically and emotionally drained working on something, even though I could be designing, I could be in client calls, which are all things that I love doing, but come out of it feeling like, oh, what is this? But then actually reassessing, thinking about what gives me energy, helping to, to, to define those things has been so helpful. I love that. So I, I'm just going to say back, because I think this is really important, what you've just said. So you ask yourself, why are you, f- what makes you feel engaged? What makes you feel positive? What makes you feel energized? And then after you've written down those things, you essentially do more of them. Mm. And the things that you're doing in real life that are not on that list that are not engaging you, making you feel positive, making you feel energized, you don't do nearly as much. That's if the you plan. can avoid That's if you can plan. avoid it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and maybe that process takes a little bit of time to cut the things that you don't enjoy as much. Um, yeah. And it's not necessarily just about enjoyment, because I think there are going to be things that you just don't enjoy and you are having a bad day and it's not good. I think it's about overall direction and trajectory. Trajectory. Mm -hmm. That's a difficult word for me right now. So sometimes I'm really 
not enjoying something, but I categorically know, okay, this is going to lead to something really great. So I will do it and I will do it with passion and purpose, even though I'm not enjoying it right now, because I can see where it's going to head. Um, I'm trying to think of an example of that. Can't right now. But that would be handy, wouldn't it, to have an example? Maybe. Well, I know what it is. Okay. Doing something laborious, potentially like, I don't know, like timesheets. I don't know if you ever track your time for something. Not everyone does it. Sometimes people think it's not important. Sometimes it is. But at the moment, we are tracking our time. And I find it very hard to do because <clears throat> I'm not quite sure why. I will, I will examine that in myself and in my heart and I'll find out why I don't find it very easy. But as soon as I'm like, okay, but I need to do this because it's leading to a better understanding of how I'm using my time. Therefore, I can do it with passion and purpose because I understand the end goal, the, the, the reason for it, I can understand. Um, so that's kind of like a slightly trivial example, but I think you can apply that then to other things that as well that are difficult. I know that this is heading towards the right thing, but then if something's difficult and you're like, but where's it heading? It's heading towards giving a website to this client. I don't even be believe in what they're doing. Then I'm like, uh-oh, I can't work on this with passion and purpose. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I like that because that's a really important distinction to make. Like there are things in life that maybe are a little bit tedious. Maybe you don't enjoy doing them in the moment um, as much as other things. But if there is, um, you know, something in the in the longer term that that is going to, um, you know, give give you some kind of passion or purpose um, down the line for, then it's worth then it's worth doing. But I love this idea of overall assessing what gives you energy positivity and and engagement and and doing more of that and prioritizing that higher um by actually you know uh, aligning what you what you say you want to do and your actions um to ensure that that actually happens so mm -hmm. hey big nuggets dropped in this episode so if anyone's feeling a little bit a little bit lost um I recommend maybe writing a list. I'm going to do that after the episode. This is why I'm saying this out loud. Um, you know, write down all the things that give you energy and positivity mm. and then working out what, how you're actually spending your time that maybe isn't giving you that so much. Maybe that's a client project that just makes you feel drained. Maybe that's working for a particular agency or, um, I don't know, doing an agency partnership with someone that just never applies to you. And you're just like, you know what? Maybe this isn't worth chasing up for the fifth time. Maybe this is just something that I shouldn't be spending my life doing as much, trying to mm. hammer it home that this person should reply to my emails. Very specific example. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to get specific to identify those things. <laughs> Sometimes you got to get it out. Okay. Tell me about, oh, yeah. oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, I was just going to say one sort of tip about finding out the things that you really engage with. It's just um, writing two things that you're grateful for for that day. Because then when you look back every six months, you can just really easily spot the patterns and things that you're grateful for. And it's not always what you expect. So that's how I found out that meaningful connections were so important. Because every day I'd just written, oh, I had really nice chats with so-and-so. Oh, I had a really nice conversation. And I was like, hmm. This seems to be quite important to me, seeing as I say it every day. <laughs> Interesting. So do you have like a gratitude journal that you that you do daily then? Pretty, yeah, pretty, yeah, roughly. Yeah, it's not, it's, yeah, not re li religiously, but overall, yeah. But I think when you're kind of spotting the positives in your life, just as a, as a daily habit or, you know, every other day, um, you kind of go through the day being like, sun's out today i'm gonna write that down later and it kind of <laughs> means that you're very much actively kind of thinking about the positives in your life rather than the mm -hmm. negatives because you're thinking yeah. about what you're going to write down later you're like oh, note to self you know that person smiled at me or whatever it is you know um and they might be very small things but actually it kind of does set yourself up um for positivity during the day so i think it's mm. a hugely valuable very very simple tip 
this is mm -hmm. more like a, a general episode. It's not a specifically web flowing, but I also think that a lot of web flowers maybe, um, you know, will take a lot of value from this um, advice about purpose, finding your purpose. That feels like every single conversation I've had with you, Lizzie, it feels like we've had a lot of this type of conversation. I feel like this is, <laughs> it is your, this is your so bread and butter. Broken record. <laughs> no, no, it's not. It's no, it's really, it's really healthy. Honestly, it's, uh, it's good. I don't think this, the type of, I think there's a lot of conversation about money in the Webflow space, which I understand because, you know, money matters and I'm not trying to say that it's trivial, but I, but I also think that it's interesting to talk about, you know, the meaning behind the projects that you do rather than how to get a bigger project. Mm. Um, and I just think it's important to, to talk about, you know, that aspect as well. Tell me about failure number three, undervaluing yourself to the detriment of your career. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think especially when I started, started out, I um, massively was like, oh, I'm just, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. I'll just charge you one peanut. This is my, I'll just take a crumb. Don't you worry. <laughs> but I think I stayed like that a little bit too long. And also, because I studied illustration, I didn't do graphic design. When I actually did get my first job as a graphic designer in a branding agency, um, I felt a little bit like everyone's, everyone's like, oh, she's the self-taught graphic designer. She, and therefore, I sort of undervalued then the offering that I was bringing, which um, I think meant that I didn't take risks. I didn't play as much as I think would have been helpful. I, I could have, I don't want to say, I could, oh, I could have done that. Um, but there could is that. For sense. Arsenal. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think limiting self belief. He's like, a, it's a real thing. It's a real thing. I think it does actually, mm. um, you sort of close doors for yourself. Mm -hmm. This idea of self-taught, um, I think is really interesting because um, some people have a kind of pride in being self-taught. It kind mm -hmm. of gives, it actually gives them this sense of self, like, I can do anything. I'm self-taught. And it's like a kind of pride thing. Whereas I think for other people, it's like, should I don't want anyone to know that I didn't go to an expensive school to study this. Like mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm self-taught, but I'll have a I'll give it a go type thing. So it's quite interesting how different personalities kind of um kind of yeah, process that and and how much people are willing to kind of um yeah, I guess value their self worth linked to linked to that. How mm. how how do you think you would have, or you wish you you responded differently to to the fact that you were self taught? Because if you're self taught, I can I just sorry, I was going to ask you a question, and then I kind of cut you off there. But I do think this is important to say. People that are self taught, I find, if they actually do the work they often have a very rich learning experience, you know, because they're just discovering for themselves that they're, they're making actively while learning in the sense that, you know, in a traditional education environment, you, you're often not, you're kind of being lectured to. Um, and, and I think people that do online courses, you know, that are making while they're doing the course or they're, um, or they're just, you know, going to the library, finding books on something, you know, they're listening to podcasts, they're doing this, that and the other. They've actually got a very rich learning experience. And I think that's very valuable as long as they've self-taught in the sense that they have actually taught themselves. I think there is a problem with self-taught where it's like, yeah, I'm self-taught. It's like, no, you just haven't like done the work and you say that you have. Yeah. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that I think you're yeah, absolutely spot on because it's not about where you got the education it's about what you've taken from it and how you're uh, implying it how you're growing and implementing and changing and developing and striving for excellence uh, which you can do by teaching yourself and you you cannot you you can miss that but then equally you can miss that after having had a formal education as well mm -hmm. 
definitely yeah. yeah and i think there's this kind of problem with like the prestige of a school being associated with the skill set of the person that's come out of it um and i've met people who've gone to quite prestigious you know academies and schools and stuff and i've been quite impressed by how unamazing they are <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I've met some people who, you know, have not come from a privileged background at all. And they are just, it's not even that they're head and shoulders above the people that went to those privileged schools, of, but they are. It's more their attitude to learning. Mm. And that's a huge difference. Yeah. You know, they are actively searching for the latest information. They are actively talking to people that are doing the thing taking their advice and applying it and testing it for themselves and and that's a very very different type of person to someone that has gone to you know one of these schools is doing the exams to pass them rather than to learn the actual academic information that they're trying to or you know that they're, they're meant to kind of give them a sense of love for that subject and yeah. I don't know. I think there's something to be said for doing Udemy courses and, and YouTube and reading and libraries and going to free talks and all paid talks. But I'm, I'm just saying, I think there's this self-taught version that's hugely powerful. Yeah. And it's like, like you say, it's an attitude that that makes all the difference. Mm. And I bet that was you, Lizzie. I bet you bet you were way better than a lot of the people in this place. <laughs> I mean, you're a very meticulous person. Meticulous. Could, could be, could be. But I, I, do you know, I reckon it was mostly down to, like, I feel like there were, there were fewer examples of it happening. There was less of this, like, this Webflow community that is happening now wasn't around at that point. It didn't have... The only other role models were like people who did go to reference design school. And mm. so maybe it was part of that, like not, not seeing it in practice. Mm. In, in, and maybe it's know. partly getting hired by people that did go to those types of schools. Yeah. I think yeah. there is a kind of, um, you know, I don't know, like old boys club of mm. certain industries. And maybe, I don't know if that's fair to say, but it does seem that um, a lot of, creative directors that that i've met are men and a lot oh. of them did go to quite prestigious oh, boys. schools yeah, yeah for sure <laughs> and you know naturally that's gonna probably affect how you um you know see see your hires i imagine mm -hmm. which is what got me so excited about when i was teaching at shillington because it literally felt like the next generation of designers and i was just so excited about that and the whole the whole mindset and the whole new way of learning and applying that learning yeah tell us about that because if anyone's listening now and they're like okay guys interesting conversation hopefully if they've been listening to 50 minutes in you know <laughs> how <laughs> what tell us about shillington cohort based courses why that's kind of challenging um these traditional education systems yeah, so if you don't know, Shillington is a graphic design boot camp and it markets itself, or it boasts that it's the original graphic design boot camp. Um, and it's a very intense course. If you do it full time, it's a very intense three month course. And um, as a teacher, I think it was so beneficial to me for my own design practice that I'd almost recommend anyone who wants to improve their design to go and become a teacher at Shillington because it honestly, it just gave me so much and so many skills in critiquing. I think that was probably one of the biggest things, actually two biggest things, process and critiquing. They were the, the two biggest things. Um, processes in like following the process, trusting the process, not skipping process, not jumping to the end product, but really going through idea generation, thumbnails, sketching, iterations, everything to really like push yourself beyond the first idea and then critique um, not settling for for average but pushing it and getting it in front of other people quickly um, other people that you trust and have good opinions and 
um, community within that as well. Mm. I don't know if that actually answered. I can't remember what the question was now. I mean, I guess you've you've answered the question okay, by good. by just being so passionate about Shillington. I mean, I was, <laughs> I was kind of interested in why um, you know why someone might investigate less of a traditional education path and maybe do kind of an accelerated course like Shillington but it definitely sounds like sounds like they've got great teachers who are super passionate and also that the teachers um get a huge amount of teaching there so if you're listening as someone that might want to teach sounds like a really great place to work as well yeah really yeah it yeah it was so good amazing so for your final question, it's a little bit harder. Are you ready? Okay. What is your next failure going to be? Ooh, good question. I um, yeah, that is a good question. <laughs> if you even want to talk about it. My next failure. I mean, it could be so many, so many things. I think it all, I would consider it a real, I would consider it a failure if I didn't put into practice all the things that I believe in and let, let something slip. I would find that really hard. Okay. Very cryptic, but I, I love it. I feel yeah. like, I feel like you have a very strong sense of self though. And mm. you, I think that's possibly your greatest asset. So I also think it would be a failure if you let those things slip, but I also don't think that's going to happen. Hmm. Or if it does, it will be for no longer than six months because you'll be having a pint on the South Bank writing down. That is so true, yeah. So maybe the, maybe the systems are in place to mitigate against that one. I don't need to worry too much. <laughs> the South Bank pint and note taking is is gonna yeah sort you right out i'm sure <laughs> yeah. lizzie you've been an amazing guest on webflow thank you for sharing so vulnerably do you have anything else any other nuggets to say to anyone listening um jack's jack's a great person to chat with so just uh Keep chatting with Jack. <laughs> oh, that's very kind of you. Thanks so much, Lizzie. If anyone wants to message you about the episode um, at all, where should they do that? Um, maybe Twitter, probably. probably Twitter at L I Z underscore Z I E Curtis C U R T I S. Anagram of citrus. Oh, yeah, and add a citrus um, to make sure that you find her. I'm sure you will. <laughs> She's all over Twitter. Lizzie, thanks so much for coming on Webflow. Thank you. Bye.